your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to be preaching on Pentecost all, all month long. Amen. So I don't feel like I have to, you know, keep you too long today and exhaust everything. But I would love for you to imagine that Pentecost, as we think about it at the Way Church, is an intersection of the power of the Holy Ghost. It is a, a, a required sense and embracing of justice. And it is about our ability to access power. All right, and so all through this month, we're going to be talking about the Holy Ghost. Somebody say the Holy Ghost. We're going to be talking about justice. Somebody say justice. And we're going to talk about power. Somebody say power. Come on, say it again. Holy Ghost, justice, power. Come on, say it again. Holy Ghost, justice, and power. So Acts chapter number two is where we're going to start because how can we talk about Pentecost? And we ain't talking about Acts chapter 2. Now, many of you know that Acts chapter 2 uh, is the particularly uh, second, uh, uh, it's the sequel to the book of Luke. Luke, the gospel writer, uh, was considered to be the scribe, the, 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 the person that uh, uh, Peter uh, gave all of his testimony to in order for, I'm sorry, Paul, yeah, Paul, because Peter gave it to Mark. Yeah, Paul gave all his testimony to and helped to create a record that would be translated into the Greek. So all the readers and the, the, the Greek culture could understand the full uh, expression and the historical record of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And after Jesus ascended in Luke chapter number 24, uh, it picks up in Acts chapter 1. And we heard that read already this morning. That as Jesus went up into the air to go back to uh, the Father, the scripture says that uh, they stood there gazing, looking up into the, earth, into the sky. It's kind of like if I was just here preaching and all of a sudden I started levitating. And I went through the ceiling. Y'all would probably keep looking up in the sky like, what kind of church did I walk in here today? Amen. Uh, but I look forward to the day when some of y'all start levitating in the Holy Ghost. Amen. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them I see a levitation in your future. Woo! My God, today. Amen. But they, they, they saw Jesus just literally being uh, like Elijah or like Moses, some of the older prophets in the scriptures. They literally saw Jesus ascending to heaven. And as they watched Jesus literally go up, up in a way, the scripture says that angels, messengers of the Lord, appeared and began to tell them and open up their understanding about what was to come. And, and they were told to go to Jerusalem. And wait. Somebody say wait. Say it again. Wait. Wait until you will be endued, uh, uh, clothed, empowered with the power from on high. Why? Because Jesus knew that there was a special mission, a special purpose that they had to accomplish in the world that even though they hung out with Jesus, I mean, like they were literally like rubbing elbows with Jesus for three and a half years, right? So it ain't like they hadn't been with Jesus. They literally hung out with Jesus, but Jesus realized, you just hanging out with me is not enough. You need some more power. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I need some more power. Come on, somebody say, I need some more Holy Ghost. I need some more justice. And we say it again, I need some more power. And so the Spirit literally was, was on the way to meet the disciples and all of those who were willing to hang out. Because how many of you know there were only 12 disciples at this time? It was probably 11. But the scripture says in the upper room there were over 120 people there. What does that mean? That means that God does not have a closed circle about who can have access to the Holy Spirit. Huh, that's good. That's good news for some of you because some of y'all been taught, you know, well, you know, it ain't for me. I'm a little too new. I ain't walked with Jesus long enough. These disciples hung out with Jesus for three years, and yet the Holy Spirit fell on 120 people at one time. Amen. That's a tenfold experience. Somebody say amen, right? And so part of what we're capturing and catching up with in Acts chapter 2 is the full record of the power of the Holy Spirit literally falling, being poured out, on all of those who were gathered together, as the scripture says, 
in one place. So Acts chapter number two, we're going to read a little bit. And verse number one says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and a tongue uh, rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. I want you to imagine again that they were all up together in a room and they were praying. Uh, I'm sure they were like singing, uh, you know, some good old worship songs. You are Alpha huh, and Omega. I don't, know, I don't know what they were singing. I'm just using my imagination, right? And, and, and they're, they're literally leaning in to God's promise that the Holy Spirit was going to meet them. Why? Because they had a mission to do. They had something to do that they could not do on their own power. Maybe that was an individual mission. Maybe it was a vocational mission. Maybe it was a collective mission. But all put together, it was the mission of the church. God's called out people to literally spread the good news to everywhere. And Jesus knew unless you had a little bit more power, you aren't going to be able to do what I've called you to do. I want you to know, child of God, that sometimes in order for you to accomplish what God wants you to do in the world, you can't go with what you have. Uh-huh. And you might have a lot. Some of you got a lot of money. Some of you like, not me. Amen. Some of you have a lot of friends. Some of you like, sometimes. Amen. Some of you say, I, I got a great legacy. Yes, you know, you come from great stock. But how many of you know what you have right now is never enough to accomplish what God is trying to do through your life? Amen. God is always trying to do something greater than you can do on your own. God is always trying to accomplish something bigger than your hands can wrap around on their own. God wants to give you the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Why? So you can do something that only God could take credit for. I don't want to preach like that today. You know, I want to be in a teaching ministry today. But, you know, sometimes when you talk about the Holy Ghost, some get a hold to you. Mm hmm. All right, let's keep reading it, man. Verse, verse number five. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, what sound? They heard. Listen to this. At the sound of a rushing mighty wind, at the sound of the building shaking, at the sound of the worship going up, at the sound of the, pre, the praying, people who were in town for the Pentecost celebration, a Jewish holiday, right? They in town for some other business, and yet they hear a sound. Sometimes, how many know God has a calendar, amen, that you don't know about and even the other folk don't know about, but in God's mind, God says, I have some timing, some special timing, and I'm going to bring everybody together at the right time. And when the timing is right, there is a sound. Lord, have mercy. There's a sound, there's a move, there's a pouring out that will literally overflow to everyone and anyone who is proximal to it. Guess what? what? What's so dope about this sound, about this experience? It don't have to only be a church. It could be in the jailhouse. It could be at the schoolhouse. It could be on the street corner. It could be while you're marching in for justice. It could be with your family. It could be by yourself. When God does something so powerful, God is not limited by the geographical location. Hmm. Hey Amen. You, 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 you ought to be glad about that. Because how many know sometimes I need to hear the sound in places that are unorthodox? I need, to, I need to have an experience in places where I did not even know God could show up. I mean, you know, it's, it's great for God to show up here on Sunday morning. Oh, and believe me, we want that to happen. But how many know sometimes, God, I need you to show up on a Tuesday midday afternoon while, while I'm fighting through traffic to go get my little daughter from school. And God, you know, these folk, they, they, they wearing my nerves out. God, I need a sound. Or maybe, God, I'm in this meeting with these folk, and they all full of the devil. And, and, and they know they full of the devil, and I know they full of the devil. And so, God, you know, I may not be at the church house. I can't wait till the prayer of a Zoom call on Tuesday. So, God, I need you to show up right now. God says, oh, I can send you a sound. You know, part of what you need to know, child of God, is you need the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is the portable presence of God. 
and it's living and dwelling inside of you. It's, 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 it's hanging out with you. It's giving you what you need to talk to your own soul, to talk to your own body, to talk to your own mind. When you can't reach Pastor Mike and you can't reach Pastor Tanisha, the Holy Ghost is there so you can have a direct line with God. Uh, somebody tell your neighbor, you need the Holy Ghost today. Amen. You need the Holy Ghost. Amen. You need a presence of God that makes such a sound. It makes such a physical impact. It invades your, your senses so people around you can, can, can stop. You're like, what's, what's going on? What, 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 what is happening? Now, you know, uh, the, the, the first experience of people when they notice the sound. They may not be able to, to quite articulate what it is. Let's keep reading because in verse number uh, eight it says, no, 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 let's let, uh, 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 verse number six, and at the sound the crowd gathered and they were bewildered, confused, befuddled, stupefied. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they confused. They, they didn't understand what was going on. Anybody ever had some experiences in your life and it was so miraculous? It was so, it was, it was so like my mind blowing. People didn't understand what was going on. People may see you after five years, after 10 years, after 20 years, and they thought for sure you wasn't going to be where you are today. And they love, what? Wait, really? You? You? <laughs> ever had that? You with the like double, like, you? Amen. And, and, and if you are smart, what you should say, no, it's not me. I, I've had an experience. And that experience may be confusing you, but the scripture goes on to say that each one of them, listen to this, because this is why we need the Holy Ghost. Each one of them heard them speaking in their own native tongue, their own native language. What did that mean? That mean that each one of these folks... 3,000, thousands of people in town not expecting to hear this sound. They're coming to celebrate a Pentecost uh, festival, which is part of the Jewish experience. But they heard the good news of God in a language they could understand. God wants to take your life, your experience, your trials and your tragedies and turn it into some good news. In a language that other people can understand. God wants to use you not to just be some, you know, church, uh, 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 church person. Because how many know that's, 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 that's the extent of some of our Holy Ghost. It works good at church. Amen. But if you push me at church, then the real me is going to come out. Somebody say amen. But God is wanting to use your life. Your whole, not just your Sunday life, but your Monday life and your Tuesday life and your Wednesday life and your Thursday and your Friday and your Saturday life. God wants to use all of that. Why? So the good news of the power of the living God can proclaim salvation, healing, redemption in a language that everybody can understand. It. Woo! I want you to know God's looking for some translators up in here. God's looking for somebody who's willing to allow your life to be a living, breathing ladder that people can read and say, I know God is real. I know God can do it. Why? Because he did it for you. And listen, I know you. Amen. <laughs> and if God can do it for you. God show sure enough can do this for me. If God can heal your body, God can do it for me. If God can redeem your child, God can do it for me. If God can rid this community of drugs, alcohol, and violence, God can do it for me. Oh, pat yourself on the chest and say, God can do it for me. God can do it for me. And then it goes on, and Peter, you know, Peter, that's the one that was out there chopping people's uh, 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 ears off. Amen. When Jesus got arrested, Peter was a thug. Praise God. Man, Peter was a zealot, they thought, they, they said. And zealots back in them days, they were the armed rebellion folks. This is good news for all you kind of radical people out here. You antifas, you, you fascists, I mean anti-fascists, you, you, you people who believe that, you know, sometimes violence is okay. Them folk follow Jesus too. <laughs> I'm here to tell you now. Man, everybody think everybody follows Jesus was nonviolent. No, that's not true. Jesus asked him to be nonviolent. <laughs> Amen. Y'all forgive me. Praise God. I was talking to a bishop. 
Hey man, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about Pentecost, but I'm still in the book, though. Just give me one quick second. I was talking to a bishop about, you know, the ways of Jesus. And, you know, he was telling me, you know, well, Pastor Mike, you got to make sure that you continue to preach, you know, uh, non-violence. I said, I do preach non-violence, but there is a passage of Scripture where Jesus went into the temple, praise God. He went into the courts because you had, you know, some, 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 some uh, uh, duplicitous uh, church leaders. And you had some folk who was hustling the people. You had some schemers, amen, and some manipulators. And Jesus went in there and he saw how the poor were being disenfranchised. He saw how they were being exploited. And so Jesus, so filled with righteous rage, the scripture says he cleared the temple out. Amen. And, and, you know, if you ever looked at the images of Jesus clearing the temple out, it was always a Michelangelo looking Jesus that was, you know, real kind of, you know, scrawny and weak. And he had a little whip in his hand. And I can imagine, you know, he's like, you know, get out, get out, get out. But that ain't my imagination of Jesus. Praise God. I think Jesus must have had a stick, praise God. Because who's running out of you? You know, if you walk into some place with a little belt and you're trying to rob a store, that person ain't going, no, nah, what? Man, you better go somewhere with that belt. Man, you come in there with a bat, a stick, something that's got some heat on it, amen. You running out, amen. Tell your neighbor, Jesus had a stick, praise God. Jesus, you know, at at some time, he was so filled with righteous indignation. Man, that, you know, he he, he preached not violence, but, you know, there was a little little something in him, praise God. When injustice arose, amen, there may have been a line. I'm not telling y'all to go across that line. I'm just telling you, that's probably why Peter was following Jesus. Peter's like, okay, <laughs> all right, I'm about that life, Jesus. <laughs> Man, you don't start none, it won't be none up over here, amen, amen. But Peter, the, 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 the one who was willing to take arms and the one who was willing to go out there and fight the Romans on behalf of Jesus, the scripture says that all of these folks hearing the good news of Jesus and some people blamed it on the I, 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 alcohol, amen. They said they must be filled with new wine, but Peter stood up, the scripture says. Uh huh. And Peter, he says, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, this needs to be known to you. Indeed, these men and women are not drunk. They're not filled with no new wine. They're not filled with alcohol. You just don't understand the sound. You don't understand that there is a power that is greater than the new wine. There's a power that's greater than the empire. There's a power that's greater than the emperor. And this power has literally seized hold of some ordinary people. Don't you know that God has some power that can seize hold of you? You think that you're not qualified. God says, I got some power for you. You've been cast aside. God says, no, I got some power for you. You think you are disqualified. God says, I got some power for you. And this power will cause you to be my witness. And somebody say my witness. God says, I want you to be a witness for me. Huh. And this is, this is then to me what the power of Pentecost is about. The founder of our denomination, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we were born and raised in, it was a holiness denomination. Holiness meant that it had these ascetic, ascetic, you heard of uh, uh, monks and, 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 and people, uh, 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 what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, people who moved out, in, uh, in uh, hermits and people who moved out into these kind of monasteries. And they would retreat from everyday regular life because they wanted to devote their whole life to prayer to reading. They would plant. They would take these, you know, uh, uh, vows of silence, vows of abstinence. They would do these things because they wanted to be closer to God's voice. And so uh, our tradition, it comes out of a holiness tradition. Uh, It comes out of a Methodist tradition, which means that, you know, Methodism was John and and, 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 uh, what was the other Wesley name? Uh, uh, Who, who? Yes, the Wesleys from and they and they they had this 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 doctrine called uh, uh, the second blessing, Amen. the second work, which meant kind of what the disciples experienced. You may have hung out with Jesus, but God wants to do a second work. Yeah. Lord, I usually do this in Bible class. If somebody say a second work. If some of you honest, God needs to do a third work. Praise God. I'm, I think I'm on my fifth one right now. Amen. But I've lost count. Maybe sixth. <laughs> Amen. What does that mean? That means that God wants to keep working on some of us. Are you a work in progress, child of God? Are you a finished product? 
I know God got to keep working on me. I know there's some folk out here that know how to get McBride out of sorts. Know how to get me, you know, moving to the right when I should be moving to the left. Or moving to the left when I should be moving to the right. Or moving forward when I should be still. God is still working on me. And the work that God wants to do is always done through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an abiding presence, but it's also a tool that God uses. It's like a catalyst. It is like that thing you put in, in, in dough to make the bread rise. It's, it's yeast, praise God. You know, there's all these kinds of metaphors that can be used to say the same thing about what the Holy Ghost wants to do in your life. It wants to change you. It wants to renew you. It wants to heal you. It wants to restore you. It wants to put you back together again. And that's why there's so many of us who, who feel like, well, you know, I have the Holy Spirit. You know, when I, you know, gave Jesus my, my, my heart and, you know, I'd say my sinner's prayer. Yes, the Holy Spirit definitely, it, it put inside you a seed. But I want you to know there's an outpour. Amen. There's an outpour. Somebody say outpour. There's an outpour. This is what we believe in Pentecostal theology. There's an outpour. That means that the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out on you. I want you to think, get in your mind, there's a difference between a drip, drip, drip and an outpour. You have a drip if you have been, you know, giving your life to the Lord. There's a drip, at least a drip or two, praise God. Somebody say amen. This is the guy that drip. You know, when I was getting in the shower this morning, hey man, I, I forgot to turn the water off yesterday uh, all the way, and so there was just a drip. I ain't had it. I, I didn't know it was on, but it was drip, drip, drip. Now, no matter how desperate I was for a shower, that drip was not going to be able to do everything I needed to be done. Somebody say man. It was gonna it was gonna clean up some things. Man, I could have got maybe 10 drips and put it in a rag. Could have got it in my hand, threw it up in the air, and and, and wherever it hits, you know, I'm just gonna be thankful. I'm trying to make it plain to somebody up in here. But how many know when I turned the faucet all the way on? It did not matter if I wanted to get wet or not. If I step in the water, whoops, my God, today, if I just took a step in the water with the faucet on every part of me, I don't even have to turn around, at least in my shower, praise God. Hey Amen. You know, sometimes you be trying to have your back because you don't want every, no, to shower every part of me without permission. I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. How many know God has an outpour and he wants to do in your life where every part of you without your permission, God says, I want to redeem it. I want to heal it. I want to restore it. I want to unleash it. Ooh, Pentecost, Pentecost, Pentecost. Why? Why does God want to do that? Not so you can say that you're so holy and sanctified. Not so you can brag about how many demons you slayed and folks you cast out. But I want you to know it's for this reason. And I'm getting ready to close. I mentioned our denomination being a holiness denomination. In 1919, right on the heels of the Azusa Street Revival, which was the modern Pentecostal movement of the 20th century. Out of the Azusa Street Revival, literally, the, the, the Pentecostal Christian uh, 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 experience, it became, along with Islam and along with hip hop, according to anthropologists, uh, the greatest cultural movement in the world. That only Islam and only hip hop can compare to the reach of Pentecostal Christianity, that countries and continents all over the world, you show up in places and they know something about the power of the Holy Ghost, tongue talking, demon slaying, uh, healing folk, uh, people who can speak in tongues and, and do great exploits, all attributed to the Holy Ghost. And so during this time, in the night, early uh, 1900s, you had a multiracial band of folk meeting in an Azusa Street mission uh, in uh, Azusa, Los Angeles, California, led by a one-eyed, uh, uh, a limited, able, bodily able man named uh, Reverend Seymour, a Methodist preacher, and Bishop Lawson and Bishop Mason and a whole bunch of folk went to the Azusa Street Revival, and they began to launch all these denominations that could help 
amplify what the experience of a multiracial led a group of Pentecostal hung, uh, Holy Ghost filled tongue talking people would do. Listen, remember 1919 was not the most progressive time in America's history. Some may argue, hey amen, we just, you know, 100 years later stuck in a time capsule. Which is another reason why we need the Holy Ghost. It's another reason. It's another reason. And this is what Bishop Lawson says. This is what Bishop Lawson says. And I'm going to close with this and I'm going to pick it up a little bit next week. Because I want this to just sit with us. Pentecostal people. Somebody say, I am a Pentecostal. Come on, say it again. I am a Pentecostal. Pentecostal people could teach those in mainline churches. He's speaking this in 1919, 1920. Pentecostal people could teach those in mainline churches a wonderful lesson by example in showing that the true people of God are one, regardless of what nationality or race they may belong. By abiding together in the bonds of fellowship, love, and organization, we trusted that the Pentecostal people would rise to redeem humanity by example and precept. It is all right to sing and shout and pray and preach loud. But what this poor world is longing for is the real love of God lived. This is Pentecost, y'all. This is Pentecost that we can demonstrate to the world. That there is a lived expression of the power of the living God. It's not about preaching loud, although we're going to preach loud. It's not about singing loud, although we're going to sing loud. It's not about praying loud, we're going to pray loud. But it's also about us, Pentecostal people, people of the Holy Ghost, people who believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. It's up to us to believe that we can live this thing out in a world looking for the lived, loved life of Jesus. This is Pentecost. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to have a radical encounter with God. Why? Because if you don't have a radical encounter with God, it's going to be hard for you to have a radical resistance to the powers of this world. You need to run into a radical encounter with God that'll change the way you talk, that'll change the way you walk, that'll change what you see and change what you hear. You need it. Why? Because this ugly, demonic, a death-filled world will try to suck all the life and the hope out of you. But how many of you know when you get that encounter with God, when you get that little nudge from the Holy Ghost, when you get that little experience that nobody can take from you, when you get that little time with God where you get that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that it don't matter what the world say no more? It don't matter what people say no more. It don't matter if they like you or not. It don't matter if they tell you that you can or you can't. It don't matter if they try to demean you or even take your life. Why? Because I got a power and an experience of the Holy Ghost that I can fall back on and help me be reminded that no weapon that's formed against me shall be able to prosper. I got an experience when I was in the upper room. The upper room may have been the prayer meeting. The upper room may have been my car. The upper room may have been my altar at home. But I heard a sound and the sound shook the house. Not the outside house. But this house, the sound shook me up. It shook some things off of me that some thought would attach to me my whole life. It shook away my abuse. It shook away my addiction. It shook away my hate. It shook away my disease. And in its place, I got power that the world can't take. I got power that the world can't defeat. I got love that can defeat every hate. I got peace that passes all understanding. I got joy that is 
unspeakable. This is Pentecost. Somebody shout hallelujah. God bless you today. God bless you today. I'm talking about a Pentecost. It's on the way. Can you perceive it? Can you hear it? Can you receive it? Lift up your hands and shout Holy Ghost. Fall fresh on me. Holy Ghost. Fall fresh on me. Holy Ghost. Thank you.